Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizer for this uh, tremendous work, and uh, today I have this opportunity to talk to you about uh, some work we do in the lab. First, I will say, you know, I'm actually a fake material scientist. I train as a physicist. And the first thing I'm, I'm thinking is not something useful, actually. What we think is uh, in, in, in new physics, we can, we, we can, we can start it, right? So, so hopefully, you know, inspired by this world, I will, I will think my thinking will be a little more useful. All right? And uh, like many of you sitting in the audience, actually, my research focuses on two-dimensional materials. And it's actually a pretty exciting functional material platform. And it's a totally thing, and it covers a broad range of physical properties, right? From, you know, initially discovered the right thing is semi-metals. And now we have semi-conductors, like two-dimensional superconductors. And we also have two-dimensional ferroelectrics, top body insulators. Now we have 2D magnets. So basically, this family of 2D materials cover a broad range of physical properties and able to actually develop technologies if we find them. And here I highlight uh, you know, the, these uh, blue colors represent the work we've done at the University of Washington. And uh, this material, uh, the two dimensional, means a common thing. So it means is we can really control the physical properties by, for example, electrostatic gatings right? and by electric fields. And also, these materials, they, they capture each other by Van forces. What it means is we can stack one material on top of the other and uh, create these artificial common structures to create new functionalities which we cannot think of in the past. And lastly, there's also a lot of control we can do on these materials. Here, just a few of them, right? A, a, a very uh, you know, a heavily pursued one is uh, twist angle controls. So we can create a new electronic state and new functionalities. And uh, as the previous speaker was talking about, anything that goes in the animal will do the very thing. You can apply a lot of string on it. So you can string and, uh, and fundamentally change the material properties. And also, you look at these uh, uh, hair structures, the uh, vinyl loss materials, right? You can already see the physical property really depends on interlayer couplings. Then we can control these interlayer couplings, for example, just applying pressures. Right? That's the most difficult of this. So today, my topic is going to focus on these uh, two dimensional magnets. And we, as we know, uh, magnetism actually has been studied over 100 years and uh, already generated a tremendous technology impact. Right? For example, you know, back to the 80s, the, the discovery of these uh, giant magneto resistance initially was discovered the uh, liquid getting temperature, but now already applied in these uh, data storage technology, for example. And one of the engineering dreams is actually about the magnetic semiconductors. So if we have these uh, magnetic semiconductors, then there's a possibility to integrate logic app operations with data storage in a single chip. This will basically revolutionize how we do computing, for example. And so even though you know magnetism has been studied for so many years, and uh, if we look at the, the history, you will find out actually there was no monolayer, two, two monolayer semiconductors or insulators with intrinsic magnetism. So the closest example people have been heavily pursued is the dilute magnetic semiconductor from the wells. So for these materials, basically you dope these uh, magnetic ions, they introduce magnetism in the system. But as, uh, as indicated by this name, right, dilute, so the speed density in the system is actually quite low. Please limit what the functionality this material can have and what the physics we can do. And the model and metals with intrinsic magnetism actually indeed exist. So the example like a cup, cobalt on copper, and a model and nickel on copper. But for these type of material systems, the substrate actually is quite important. As I showed you here, right, they always use copper. So this magnetic property actually hing hinges on what substrate you can use. And the isolated 2D magnet actually does not, did not exist before. And when I look at the, you know, the, the, this uh, research, well, what I found is uh, the difficulty is how to get these models, right? That, that's the really lim limitation. You know, they, we cannot get these uh, two-dimensional magnets. But now we know how to get to a model, get to two-dimensional, without any fancy technique, right? We just need the scotch tape. And uh, the other important criteria is we have to be lucky to find vulnerable, for example, magnet with robust magnetism and also can be exfoliated. Because not every vulnerable magnet can be exfoliated. So we need to find a, we need to be lucky and find a one which can be exfoliated for Star Wars and then uh, see what we can get. So this is a sort of uh, uh, you know, how, we, how we find these uh, 2D magnets. So I collaborated with Michael McGuire at the Oxford National Lab. He basically re revisited the, the bulk crystal property of chromium by 
outlier, and what he found is two things important. The first is the theory temperature of this uh, bulk crystal is about uh, 60 Kelvin. So this is important because we know when we lower, when we reduce the dimensionality of the magnets, the Curie temperature will drop. But there's a lot of room left right below 60 Kelvin. So this is encouraging. The second thing is he found is that there's a really strong up plane as hot peaks. And uh, you can, as it indicates here, right, all the string is pointing out the plane. So this strong anisotropy is also really important for stabilized uh, magnetic order at the two-dimensional limit. So with that, we start to do explorations, and it turns out it's quite straightforward. And the only subtlety is we have to work in a glass box because this material is not stable in the ambient conditions. So as I showed here, uh, this optical microscopic <coughs> image, just by looking at the optical contrast, you can already identify one layer, two layers, three layers, etc. So the next is to, to look at this uh, magnetic property using this technique called magneto optical curve rotation effect. So this really simple technique to, to probe this in any other. What we do is we shine linearly first light to a sample. Then we look at the, this rotation of this linear polarization in the reflection light. So this angle, right, this rotation angle, the K is called curve rotations. Okay. And a hallmark of this uh, ferromagnetism is we look at this curve rotation as function of magnetic field as it indicates in its horizontal axis. And uh, this uh, orange and the green curve represent the strict directions of this magnetic field, basically you know, up and down. So now you will see the hysteresis curve, right, for this uh, rotation as function of magnetic field. This hysteresis is the hallmark of ferromagnetism. It's basically the memory effect. Yeah. So what we do is then we, we do these correlation measurements on this model A. And the only thing we did for this particular data is I look at the rotation intensity map across this model A. And without applying any magnetic field, the only thing we did is we just pulled down the sample at the 15 calories. And we can already see a homogeneous correlation signal across the whole sample range. So this indicates we do have a, a magnetism. And, uh, then we park our laser to one particular spot. Then we sweep the magnetic field and look at this correlation, you will see this resist here, right? As I mentioned to you, in a PC hit resist, you know there's ferromagnetism. So this demonstrates we have the first ferromagnetic model and it's an insulator. And the, the spin is going on a plane, so this is like an icing type of ferromagnet. We can also measure the signal as function of a temperature, and this gives us uh, the this covers what is the curative temperature for these Amalian magnets. It's about 45 Kelvin, actually not much lower than the bulk crystal. <coughs> so this indicates the internet coupling in these uh, magnets is weak. So the, the, the data I show you just now it shows we have a ferromagnet. The next thing I'm going to show you is uh, it is indeed an insulator. So the way we do it is we look at the luminescence from a sample. And uh, before this work, I would emphasize actually there's no single um, luminescence measurements from any intrinsic ferromagnet insulator. So this is actually the first example and in a model limit. So what we did is we shine linear press light to the sample. The reason I do linear polarization is because it doesn't break the universal symmetry of the system. Then I look at the um, polarization result the luminescence in the sample. I look at the right circular and left circular component. They are color coded. So, if the system doesn't have a, a magnetism, then there should be no spontaneous circuit position. So the right should be the same as the left component in the, in the line emission. If there's a spontaneous circuit position, it means time of the symmetry breaks, then there should be a magnet model. So first, let's look at the data at the 70 Kelvin, right, without applying the magnet field. You can see where the left circuit parts component is the same as the right circuit, so there's no magnetism. <coughs> So once we, we cool down the sample to 15 Kelvin and uh, without applying an effect again, right, you can clearly see the blue is much stronger than the red. So there's a spontaneous circular polarization in these uh, light emission from these small insulators. So I can plot this uh, degree of polarization as function of magnetic field. And you can also see this heat resistance curve. Again, right, what I would like to emphasize is previously the mode measurements we measure the reflection of the light from the sample. And what I'm showing you here is uh, this uh, is light emission from the sample itself. So both of them show these uh, hysteresis curve. Even though we measure three different physical quantities, but they point into the same origin of the, the signal, which is from this magnetic order. And another kind of surprising result for us is uh, we found there's an interesting layer dependent on magnetic states. Right here, I show you the correlation signal as function of layer section is from one layer to the full layer from top to the bottom. 
And clearly, right, for the, there's an even other effect. For the other number of layers, we see this increasing curve, right, for one layer and three layers. But uh, for the even number of layers, right, look at the four, two layers and four layers. There's no hysteresis curve at the small field, and also um, the coefficient signal vanishes. So this indicates for these even number of layers, it's anti ferromagnetic orders. So now we know this is coming from this, the so called layered anti ferromagnetic uh, physics. This is used by layers example, right? And for individual model layers, the string is, a, is a still a ferromagnet, so all the string are lying in one direction. But the, the interlayer coupling is anti ferromagnetic. Right. So, you know, for example, here the top layer is pointing, the, the magnetization is pointing up, the bottom layer of the magnetization is pointing down. So, this top and the bottom magnetization cancel each other. There's no net magnetization on the systems, then there's no signals. Okay? So, now, um, I, I, I told you, right, now we found these at Kumi and Trida, actually, to tell me things a little bit, these magnetic functions. And we know in the 3D material, there's another one of material, which is a uh, boron nitride. Hexagonal boron nitride is a tell me thing insulator. And uh, we can use it as substrate, we can use a ton of areas, right? We can, there's a lot, lot of physics we learned actually by using these high like, of four nitrates. But what, what I'd like to explain now is uh, we have this atomic thing insulator with magnetic functions. Then we can, in principle, replace this cathagon of four nitrate with this chromium fiber, and we should see new functionalities coming out of devices, right? And the key I'm going to show you example is uh, a jam that telling magne magneto resistance from these hydro uh, so here is the, the basic you know, the device structure of, this, of, of, of the uh, tunnel junctions. We have these uh, uh, magnets in the middle as a tunnel barrier, and the top, top and the bottom we have these uh, we have these uh, tunneling contacts, these square things. Okay, so so GMR is a general manual resi resistance. It's a basic principle for for these uh, um, digital you know uh, for, for these uh, hard disk drive based on these uh, digital technologies, and uh, the, the principle for that is. Uh, as I showed here, there's a tunnel barrier, which is non-magnetic, and then there's a, a two contacts, top and bottom. These contacts are uh, ferromagnetic. By controlling the orientation of these two ferromagnetic contacts, either aligned or anti-aligned, then we can realize these uh, uh, tunneling, we can realize these, uh, the difference between the tunneling resistance, right? This difference can be characterized by this formula here. It's called tunneling manual resistance. So, you can think of it now. One represents the, the, the information of, of the bits one, the other represents information zero. So now we have a zero and a one, two digits, right? And this, we, use, we use these to, to store information specific for these hard disk drives. And, and uh, currently, the right, state of the art technologies is to use an MGO as a kind of area. And uh, this MGO favors a certain type of 3D magnets. And the state of the art uh, tunneling manual resistance is about 500% of room temperature and about 10,000%, about 1,000% actually of the low temperatures. So there's another way to realize these uh, GMR effects. It's called spring filter magnetic tunnel junctions. So in this case, now the contacts is not magnetic, right? Let me remind you, right? In previously, the contacts are actually magnetic, but the tunnel barrier is not magnetic. And in this new design, the contact is not magnetic, but the barrier is magnetic. So what you do is, for example, you look at these uh, uh, tunnel barriers, right? So if the tunnel barriers, these uh, magnetic tunnel barriers, if the two adjacent layers, the magnetization is, uh, is aligned, then the tunnel current can, tunnel current can, can, can be allowed. If the, the magnetization is adjacent layer in the tunnel barrier actually is anti-aligned, then the tunnel current will be suppressed. So from this, we can realize this uh, tunneling manual resistance. And uh, uh, people have been pursuing these uh, new, new ideas for many years. And there's one successful example based on uh, uh, demonstrating MIT Modelo's group. So they, they engineered this uh, artificial magnetic tunnel barrier based on European sulfide structures. And they can show that uh, indeed uh, magnetic resistance effect on the other 40% of the, of the low temperature. So you can see that the challenge of this scheme is to find a tunnel barrier, right? Because for this artificial tunnel barrier, when you make a, you know, many layers together, first of all, it's not a thing anymore, and the, the surface is not as smooth. So all these limits what the, the, time, you know, the, the, the physical property of the functionality of the device. Now let's go back to this uh, um, bilayer comment writer. Actually, it's a perfect tunnel barrier to realize this is uh, device, right? As I mentioned to you, for this bilayer, 
Actually, it's an anti-ferromagnet insulator. So the top layer is a uh, it's ferromagnet, so you can consider it as a string filter. The bottom layer itself also a string filter. But these two string filters have the opposite direction train. One is pointing up, the other is pointing down. Then if you pass current through this string filter, it will be blocked because these two filters, you know, they point to be they, they, they are sort of aligned. And what we can do is we can apply a magnetic field and to align these two string filters in one direction, then the tunneling current will be allowed. So by doing this, right, we can rather realize this uh, tunneling magnetic resistance based on this bilayer structure. So here, here on the, the other example is that we can also align a spin by applying magnetic field in planes. So there's two directions with how we can align these things. So the summary is, well, Bailey is a very nice double spin filter. Without applying magnetic field, it suppresses the tunneling current. Applying magnetic field, we can enable the tunneling current. So this realize zero and one, you know, these one bit operations. So we make these uh, tunnel junctions, this optical measurement device, right, with a uh, bilayer common triadine in the middle and with graphing as to um, tunneling context, tunneling balance. Now first we look at the, the tunneling current as function apply the bias. The zero field, okay, this purple field really shows what the tunneling behavior is. Then we can apply magnetic field to align the spring, so you can see now the tunneling current is increased. We can also apply a field going in horizontal directions. Again, the tunneling current also increased compared to the without applying magnetic field. The difference between in plane and out of plane implies we have these anisotropic and magnetic resistance in the, in, in the system. So we can calculate the tunneling magnetic resistance as function of the bias. You can really see, right, for this bilayer structure, only Couple of nanometers. It already has a, a spin field TMR on the order of uh, 500%. Okay. And uh, we can confirm this uh, TMR is indeed coming from this, uh, this uh, spin field effect. Basically, the top panel shows my coefficient measurement. This tells us what is the magnetic states we have. And you can see that the end current states, the current current is small, right? It's low current plateau. And uh, when the Things are aligned, now the time current is large. Okay. So this is uh, the effects reverse this uh, uh, TMR. So the nice thing about uh, this uh, spin filter junction is we can sort of program these, uh, uh, the tunnel barrier, right? Because this tunnel barrier now is in the middle between two contacts. We can program uh, the, the, this tunnel barrier and realize new functionalities. So for example, just by simply adding another spin filter, three layers. I can clearly say right, the tunneling current, the TMR actually will be much larger. We can already realize TMR on the other grade, you know, a few thousand percent. I can add another layer with four layers. Now the TMR can be as large as, uh, you know, five, fifty thousand percent, larger than anything we know. And another very interesting thing is, because these are multiple layers, right, in, in these structures, and it's possible to realize multiple magnetic states. With these multiple magnetic states, then we can realize multiple manual resistance states. Okay. As I showed you here for the four layer, you can already see there's a low current plateau, there's intermediate state, and the high, high current plateau. So each state you can think of it represents one bit different information strength. Right? So instead of we can have a zero and a one, now we have a zero, freedom of one, two. Now you can think of it, you can add more layer into it. You can have a, you can, you can have these uh, manual resistance states to represent one, two, three, four, five, etc. So this can be used for, for much better storage, for example. will be different from what we do right now. Okay, and uh, a, a very nice thing about these, uh, these structures is uh, because interlayer coupling you know, is really weak, so it's possible to apply electric field to control this interlayer coupling. This will realize electric control of these magnetic states. Then this will be useful for, for example, for, your, for your electrical way to you know, use the electric field for example, to read and write a, a data storage system. This will save a lot of energy compared to current technologies. So this example, what we do here is, I use a bilayer system, as I mentioned to you, where right? they have a two states. And uh, now if I do correlation management, right? here's a spring flip transitions. These correspond to the, the, the magnetic field we need to flip these states from these anti magnetic to fully spring flip states. So we fabricate these uh, dual data structures with top and bottom gates. And the waste is a uh, common try that value in the middle. Then, what I show you here is a correlation signal as function of the magnetic field and also gate voltage in the vertical axis. 
the, the blue and the red color just corresponding to the large protein signal when all the spinnings are aligned. But in the middle, there's no signal, right? This corresponds to the anti primary state. So what's interesting here is you can see the slope here. The slope represents the critical field the first thing flow transition happens. This is the field we need to flip the states from these anti primary and anti primary states. And this is an example of how we can control these magnetic states by using a, a data bullet. So I can fix my magnetic field, just switch my data bullet, as I show here. So the radio access is the signal. So when the signal is small, it represents the anti-permanent magnetic field. And when the signal is large, it represents the permanent state. So here's the really example is just simply by switching the data bullet, we can drive a system from a anti-permanent to a fully spin state. So this represents the electrical switching of the magnetic state. Okay, so another example I just mentioned to you, for, for the areas and multiple states, for example, in the intermediate state, we have these uh, four different states. And uh, the bottom two states actually the energy stable states, right? The, bottom, the difference between these bottom two states is the minority layer with, uh, uh, with uh, this magnetization can be in the second layer or it can be in the third layer. In terms of magnetization, they degenerate, but uh, they are not a degenerate in terms of uh, uh, tunneling resistance. So we can apply gate voltage to control these two states, basically switching between these two. For example, let's focus on these intermediate plateaus, right? When I, my, my gate voltage is re represented by these red dots, I only see one plateau. When I go to these purple dots, now we see two plateaus, right? I already showed up, corresponding to these two different demand states. And lastly, I can use green dots and I can switch from one state to the others. We can also directly switch the, the resistance from these two states by applying gate voltage, as I showed here. And first, right, we start with uh, you know high voltage to low. I switch the current from this to that. Then I can switch the gate voltage back by applying gate you know, switch negative. Then you can see this orange. Here. So this represents direct switching from this uh, one minus state to the other. And uh, this uh, uh, his research curve is uh, his demonstration that's a uh, um, very strong manual electrical coupling in the system. All right. The last example I'm going to show you is. Uh, we can also use the system actually possibly for nonlinear optical effects. So here I'm going to show you these uh, uh, non-reciprocal second harmonic generations in these biases. So this work is in collaboration with the Sway group of the Fudan University. So second harmonic generation, right, is a really sensitive probe to the inversion symmetry. So the, in a nutshell is in second harmonic generation means I send in a photon that I actually get we call fundamental frequencies. Then the output of light will be twice frequency of the fundamental, so it's two omegas. This is very useful for optical communications. And the second harmonic generation needs an inversion symmetry breaking. So basically on the electro dipole approximations, only the system with the inversion symmetry breaking allows these uh, uh, second harmonic generations. So let's look at uh, the chromium side. In a model layer, but I show is a, a crystal structure, has a D3D point symmetry group, means it has inversion symmetry. The electro double, uh, second moment duration is the electro double ability. So if I look at bilayer, when you add another layer on top in the same orientations, inversion symmetry actually remains, then second moment duration also the electro double abilities, right? Based on the crystal structure. However, now if you add a sting to the systems, because I told you, right, bilayer has these anti permanent states. You know, for example, it's the top layer has been pointing up, the bottom has been pointing down. Then you do time of the operation, you will see those different states. Now, second common generation is the electro that will allow in these anti permanent states. Well, if I use my method to, to, to align these uh, spinning in the same direction, then I can easily convince yourself, right, the inversion symmetry now restores. So, second common generation is the electro that will prevent again. So, we can control these minus state to control these uh, second common direction. So first, we look at the data, right, at the 50 calories for this bilayer. Now we do this mapping. You see nothing, right? Which makes sense because the crystal is an is a inversion symmetric, so it doesn't give second harmonic generation signal. And the manual order hasn't come in, so there's no second harmonic generation. So now if I go to 5 calories, okay, and we do correlation signal measurement, you will see it's typical to a bilayer with anti parameterism. Now we look at the mapping again. For this the signal harmonic, at the zero magnitude, you will see a very strong second harmonic direction signal coming out. Okay. Then if I apply my magnitude to align all these things, say pointing down, you will see the second harmonic direction signal vanish. Right okay. So this is consistent with the total of the cosmic state control symmetry of the system. 
then we can map out the signal as something temperature. So the signal increases as we lower the temperature below it. Is 45 Kelvin, which is pretty good temperature for the main order to form. And above this temperature, the signal vanishes. So this confirmed is a second harmonic region signal indeed coming from this uh, layer and the main order. So we can control this main order to control these uh, non output effects. So lastly, I want to compare this uh, signal, you know, this second non this second order non linear quality compared to the system we know. So for the other uh, two-dimensional system, like Mala and my we know is one of the material with the strongest signal order right now in the signals. And uh, if I have the, the, the data I show you here, it's all measured in the same system. Okay, we measure in the same setup, use the same conditions. So for these Mala and my you will see with two photon investments with two minus x on the signal measure already several factors smaller than the bio CR3. Also, this bilayer CR3 second common direction signal is much larger than this mono and regular board measure. It's about a two order magnitude larger. And another classic example for anti burn magnet is this uh, bulk crystal chromium 2 tri trioxide. And this, this in bulk crystal, you will see the second common generation signal actually is about three order magnitude smaller than my atomic balance. So this is kind of remarkable, right? This bilayer current trial actually has a has a really really large second order non-linear optical effects based on this uh, layer anti environment order. So this can be potentially useful for this non-linear optical functionality. Okay. So here just a summary. I won't I won't go go through this, but I want to uh, emphasize this. Uh, you know, since we discovered these uh, two-dimensional magnets a couple of years ago, and uh, the field actually progressed rapidly. There's a lot of uh, two-dimensional magnets being discovered in the last couple of years, and uh, there's a lot of, I probably haven't missed here, you know, because uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a rapidly progressing field. So I want to emphasize a few examples, you know, for example, vanadium iodide. So we recently showed this is a, a new type of ferromagnetic semiconductor down to a model layer damage, and with carry temperature about 60 Kelvin. So the interesting thing about this system is that it could be a model easily candidate. Okay? So it, it will be interesting to do, you know, the electrostatic gaming controls to see how, how the main order you know, forms. The second example is uh, FGT. This is a, a, what I told you, today the example is a semiconductor, right? But uh, we also have uh, discovered these small layer metals. And what I show you here is uh, how this uh, layer thickness it determines the, the critical temperatures and how the main order can transform as functional layer thickness from two dimensional S to three dimensional S And uh, recently we also show this particular compound, it's also FGT, but with a five, um, it's actually a room temperature two dimensional thermomagnet. So lots of people ask me, can we get to the room temperature, you know, two dimensional? The answer is yes. And the last example I'm personally really excited is uh, uh, this uh, uh, Magnus business. Uh, right. Actually, recently, as many groups shows is a topological magnet. Now we have an opportunity to combine this topology with magnetisms and to really expand the functionalities of these magnet magnetic systems. And with that, I would like to thank you for my colleagues and the drivers who who will cover still this work and uh, my students. Uh, maybe thank you. Thank you. And one or two quick questions uh, in the back. Based on the tunneling measurements, also based on these bulk measurements. 
you can see different states. Is, is, the, is that possible that you have four layer, for example, and bottom the two layer uh, line and top two layer line instead of the antiferromagnetic? It's possible if you break the symmetry of the system. If you change the stack a little bit, yeah. So we do see signature like that.